All right, if you have your Bibles, I hope you do. Go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 6, verses 14 through 29. And while no passage is easy to, to teach from, no passage in Scripture is an easy text to come to, this one is particularly difficult, uh, not because of any interpretational issues or theological disagreements, but because of the content, because of the subject matter, the magnitude of what had transpired, the gravity of the situation. John the Baptist was now John the Martyr. He had abdicated, he lost his head because of his faith, because of his trust, his love, his devotion, his surrender to Yahweh. That is why he lost his head. And a text like this forces us to ask the question, am I willing to follow the Lord no matter the cost? It forces you to ask that question for you. Are you willing to follow the Lord, to trust the Lord, to serve the Lord no matter the cost? even if it would cost you your life. And that's a question that only you can answer between you and the Lord, but it is a question that each and every one of us has to answer. But it, it forces us to ask that question, and hopefully and prayerfully the answer is yes. But as you and I walk through life and experience the pain of being judged, being hated, being slandered, losing jobs, uh, losing friends, sacrificing our very lives, Another question arises in the midst of all the tears and the turmoil. God, I have, I have followed you according to your word. And this is where it's gotten me. What am I missing? And that's kind of the question that believers can feel at times. God, I, I'm, I'm following this. I'm obeying this. What you have said. What is going on? Why is this happening? Because in this passage, John told this is what John told Herod. He told Herod, what you're doing is not biblical. It's not godly. It's not honoring. It's not just. It's not pure. You cannot do this. He was calling this man to repentance. And because of his faithfulness to God and to his word, he was thrown into prison and eventually lost his life for it. And the way that Mark ends this account, if you read throughout this chapter, which we will, the way he ends it in verse 29 is when his disciples heard of it, they came and they took his body and they laid it in the tomb. But that's it. That's kind of how he ends it. And he closes the account in that way, and then he flips to the next thing, which we'll talk about next week. But that's it. He's just, his body's been thrown into a tomb and laid there, and then we move on. So I close the book, end of the story. But the way Mark wrote this, I want you to see this, the way Mark wrote this was masterfully well done, because he sandwiched this in between two accounts, um, um, right in between, Jesus actually sent out his disciples into the world. I'm sending you out to the, the lost people of the house of Israel. I'm sending you out two by two to different cities, different places, to go spread the word, spread the message of my salvation. Then we have this account of John getting beheaded for his faith, losing his life. And then we enter in next week, they come back. They're telling Jesus all that has happened, all that's transpired, all that God did on their behalf on the missionary journeys that Jesus sent them on. Not chronological order of events. Uh, the, John Baptist had already passed away, but Mark put it here for specific reasons, to make a point, that following God will not be easy. Following God will not be easy, no matter what anybody tells you, no matter what you and I might think, no matter what might be uh, contrary to popular belief, following God will not be easy. Instead, following God will cost you dearly. It will cost you everything. And this passage that we are entering into this morning, Mark 6, and passages like this have forced believers throughout each and every generation to think on and consider this question. Following God, where does it get you? And there are three answers to this question. Number one, following God, in this world, you will be persecuted. It's a guarantee. It's going to happen. If you choose to live for Christ, if you choose to walk according to his word, you will be persecuted. There will be some form of persecution will come your way. It may not be like the, the people in Afghanistan or North Korea. You know, Historically, we just haven't seen uh, that type of severe persecution come on us as of yet. But we will be persecuted, whether verbal or physical or whatever it might be. Persecution will come to those who trust in Christ. In this world, you will be persecuted. In this world, you may be executed. You may lose your life. That may be a possibility. That might happen. 
Again, historically, it hasn't happened here, generally speaking, as like you go to other places around the world. But it is very much a real possibility in this world that we live in. And so you will be persecuted. You may be executed. But this is kind of the truth. Mark doesn't spell it out here, but he leaves us to think about it, to just reflect, to think on, consider what the gravity of the situation. Are you willing to follow the Lord no matter the cross? I'm leaving it here. John was beheaded, lost his life, thrown into a tomb. And that's it. And so for us, we would look at that, and that's the end of the story. That's the end of the road. Where's the hope in that? And that's how he leaves us, with thinking, with contemplating, with considering the hopelessness of that situation. Yet what we see throughout the rest of Mark, and what we see throughout the rest of the Bible, is that after this, you shall be exalted. After this, you shall be exalted. And so this world has trials, has tribulations, has severe pain. But what comes next is totally worth all of that, every bit of it. And so in Mark chapter 6, this is what it says. Mark 6, verse 14, it says, King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said John the Baptist had been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are working him. But others said he is Elijah, and others said he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John whom I beheaded has been raised. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, It, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, For what should I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Where will following God get you? The first answer to this question is that in this world, you will be persecuted. You will be persecuted. You can mark it down as a guarantee. And the reason is because if you are following Christ, then your words, your life, tend to make people feel guilty. We see that a lot in our culture. And when people feel guilty, they become angry. And when they become angry, they do things that are irrational toward you. And so your life, your words, if you are following Christ, you are living according to his word, makes people feel guilty, which makes people become angry. And things happen sinfully when people become angry. And we live in a society and among people who hate God and they directly oppose him at all costs. For example, the Lord considers life sacred. So what do we do? We abort it. That's just kind of our natural tendency. We do the exact opposite. We don't treat life as sacred. Instead, we make it easier for life to be taken. The Lord clearly defined and firmly established marriage. So what do we do as a culture and society? We redefine it. And we work tirelessly to make it even easier to divorce it. That's what we do. The Lord designed the beauty of gender, and so what do we do? We despise it. And those are just three of countless examples of how our society has turned and is turning its back on God. But it's not just those people out there that are the sinners. We, right here in this room, have the same sinful nature and evil tendencies. And none of us enjoy being called out for sin. No one enjoys that. That's not comfortable for anybody. We uh, try to downplay it. Oh, it's, it's not that big of a deal. Oh, you don't know. Uh, we make excuses. Well, you don't know the context or, you know, you had to be there. You weren't there. Different things. We blame others as if their sin might justify my sin. Well, you don't know what they did to me or, or that person said we actually blame others as if their sin justifies our sin. 
Sometimes we respond in repentance. This is true of believers and unbelievers. Sometimes we apologize. Sometimes we move on from this. Sometimes we respond with repentance, while other times we respond with rejection. I think of uh, King David. King David in 2 Samuel chapter 12, I want to say it is, somewhere around there. King David has sinned with Bathsheba. He, he uh, should have been with his people during the, battle, during the time of war, but he wasn't. And because he was sitting back in his palace, he was prone to temptation. And he walked out on his balcony one, one evening, and he saw a beautiful woman kind of looking down. He could see the kind of whole city, and there was one house in particular. And then he saw a woman, and she was bathing. For whatever reason, he could see her, and he began lusting. And he should have been at the battle scene with his men, but he wasn't there. He was already in the wrong place because he wasn't being obedient. And so now it's this led, he, now he's bored, he's distracted, he doesn't know what to do, and Satan is just able to weed temptation into his life and put seeds uh, of evil onto his mind. He sees this woman, here's the prime opportunity, her husband is gone, and so he sends for her, she comes, she gets pregnant, and he gets worried, and so he brings Uriah back from battle, I need you to basically go home and be with your wife because I need to hide this. Uriah says, I will not go and be with my wife. How could I when all of our men are on the battlefield, a place where, David, you should be as well? And so he's kind of shaming uh, King David, and David then sends him back with his death letter, and Uriah dies that day, and then he takes Bathsheba to be his wife. And then we have nine months go by, and she's now had this baby. David still has not repented. David, the man after God's own heart, it took him over nine months to actually come back to God, to repent of this situation. Nathan the prophet comes to him and says, David, there, there's, there's this man in, in the kingdom. He has this, he's a poor man. All he has is one sheep. And this sheep, this sheep, I mean, he pets this sheep. He loves this sheep. This is his sheep. I mean, when, they, when he goes to bed, the sheep just like flops on the bed and lays next to him. I mean, he just, he sleeps with his sheep. He loves his sheep, feeds his sheep, takes it for a walk. This is his pride. This is family. It's not just some, a meal that he's going to have in a little bit. Like, this, this is his family. But then there's this rich man over here on the other side of town, and he has plenty of sheep, plenty of livestock, plenty of wealth, everything. So complete contrast. And he, a visitor comes to see him, and instead of taking one of his own sheep to feed this guy, to prepare a whole meal, he steals this guy's sheep. His, his pride and joy, the only thing he has left, he steals this guy's sheep. And David says, that man should die for that. You know, he basically condemns this guy. He doesn't, even know, the, doesn't know the people involved, doesn't know anything except for this story that, that Nathan has given him. And Nathan's like, David, you're that dude. You just stole this guy's sheep. And so then David, it causes him to repent at that time. But it shows that not, none of us like being called out for sin. Sometimes we respond to repentance. The other times we respond to rejection. For nine months, David had responded in rejection. He would not repent until Nathan came with that story and rebuked him. The point is that this same spirit that reacts poorly when confronted with the truth of God's message and verbally and physically attacks God's messenger, it resides in each and every one of us. Which means... Persecution can and will come from fellow students, and go back to college, at school, high school, even I think back to my days in college or at school. There are times when persecution will come against you. If you're walking with the Lord, if you're living according to His word, if you're trying to tell people about Jesus, persecution will come. It may not be your life, but persecution will come from fellow students, employees, employers, co-workers, Maybe you could lose your job. Maybe, you know, it could be that serious at times. But the fact is that if you're living according to God's word, persecution will come in some form, in some fashion. It could come from other Christians, even. It could come from gangs, mobs, various groups of people, and government authorities, which is what we see in our passage today. John 15, verses 18 through 20. This is what Jesus said. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, 
Therefore, the world hates you. Remember that the world, the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Jesus did not say they might persecute you. He said they will persecute you. Even Paul in 2 Timothy even said that all who desire to live a godly life will be persecuted. It will happen. Where will following God get us in this world? You will be persecuted. Verse 14 goes on to say, this is how our passage begins. It says, King Herod heard of it. What's he hearing of? He's hearing of all the miracles. He's hearing the testimony. He's hearing word about Jesus is spreading like wildfire, especially now that Jesus has sent out his disciples to go throughout all the land of Israel. Now they're going from city to city. They're doing healings. So it's not just one kind of one guy in one. He, he's only in one place at a single time. Now he's, he's multiplying himself. And so word is spreading even faster. It's accelerating even quicker. And just for clarification, this is Herod Antipas. So Herod the Great uh, was his father. Herod the Great was when Jesus was born. Uh, they, were, they were in Bethlehem. The Magi came to see Jesus. They caused quite the stir in the city of Jerusalem. And they told Herod, we're looking for the, the king who was born. We're, we've come to worship him. And Herod is already at that point fearing for, wait, no, 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 I'm king. There's, there's to be no other ruler. But he deceive, he tries to deceive the Magi, saying that, when, hey, when you find this baby, please come bring word to me, because I want to come and worship this baby as well. And they know that, that Herod's up to no good, and so they end up not going back. But when Herod realizes that he's been duped, and that they didn't go see him and tell him the information of where he could find this child, he sends his army into Bethlehem, and they murder Every little boy, two years old and under, that is Herod the Great. This is his son, Herod Antipas. And this whole family is, is a little messed up, as we'll see. But he ruled from about 4 BC to 39 AD. When Herod the Great died, his kingdom was kind of divided between his sons. And so this is the kingdom in which Herod Antipas ruled. So he ruled Galilee and the region of Korea. And Galilee is where Nazareth was, where Jesus was from, Capernaum, different places like that. Mostly where Jesus' ministry took place up there in northern Galilee, and then in the region of Korea, beyond the, beyond the Jordan. And Herod Antipas married his brother's wife. So at some point he went to see his brother Philip, and he seduced her, she seduced him, not really sure what happened there, but somehow she was convinced, I'm going to divorce my husband and I'm going to come marry you. And so he brought his brother's wife back with him. And so they got married, they eloped. And now in our passage today, he was seduced into making this foolish vow by his niece, or his stepdaughter, her daughter, dancing provocatively before him. So this just kind of shows you that this is a man who needed to be corrected and called to repent and that's what John did. Mark 6, 18 says, For John had been saying to Herod, and this is a continual thing. It wasn't a one-time thing like, Herod, you can't do this, and then he kind of moved on. No, this is something that John kept saying. He kept calling him to repentance. You cannot do this. This is against the law. Herod, you cannot rule this way. It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And he took this from the Levitical law, Leviticus Chapter 18, verse 16 says, You shall not uncover the nakedness of your brother's wife. It is your brother's nakedness. In Leviticus 20, 21, If a man takes his brother's wife in impurity, he has uncovered his brother's nakedness. Herod, what you have done is sin. This is shameful. This is dishonoring. John had repeatedly called this ruler out, which is why Herodias, his wife, his brother's ex-wife, had a grudge against him. She absolutely hated this man. She wanted to put him to death. And Herod ended up arresting him and ultimately beheading him. But now, word about Jesus is accelerating even faster because he sent out his disciples to preach the word and perform miracles. And it says, King Herod heard of it, for Jesus, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. And that is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said he is Elijah, and others said he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. Now, there's three options here. Number one is, this is John. He's been raised from the dead. That's what some people were saying. Number two is Elijah. 
And there's a reason for that, that they would be saved. Number three, it's just prophecy. It's, it's one of the prophets. There were prophets in the Old Testament back in the day when, when God would work miracles through them. So he's just one of the prophets. So Jesus has three possible identities. Even when he asked his disciples at one point, who do people say that I am? The disciples gave the same answers. Well, some say you're John the Baptist, but obviously they knew, but that's not true. We knew John, we saw John, we know you. You guys were kind of operating at the same time, and you've already been doing miracles. So obviously they kind of knew that wasn't true, but they were just telling him, what people say. Some think you're Elijah and some think you're one of the prophets. So these were kind of the three categories that people had placed in. And when when Herod believed that John had possibly risen from the dead, this could be that he physically rose from the dead, but it probably might not mean that because Herod could have just gone to the grave, saw, hey, there's half his body and there's his head. You know, we still have that in the back room. Like, he could have kind of seen, you know, that's not John physically, but that it would be like his his and once it's his spirit of power and authority has now rested upon this man and is kind of like haunting him, so to speak. His words and his works are now haunting him. And so Herod believed that John had been raised from the dead and his words and works had come back to haunt him for unjustly taking his life. It could have been kind of like how when uh, the chariot of fire came down and swept up Elijah and took him up to heaven, his, his kind of, not his spirit, but his... Uh, the power that was on Elijah rested then on Elisha. And so he got the he, he kind of got God's spirit of, of power of miracles that he was able to, to use as well. And so it might be kind of more what he's uh, what he's talking about here. But either way, he he this was his conclusion. John had risen from the dead, and this was kind of haunting him. Because you can tell that this man is guilty. And he has a guilty conscience. He did not want to do this to begin with, but he made the foolish vow. And now because of that, he can't sleep at night. I mean, he is thinking about this. He's wondering. He's curious. The news of this guy is spreading and all that he's doing. And he is holding on to this guilt, whereas obviously his wife is still excited. The second option, why would they say Elijah as a possibility, is because the very last prophecy in the Old Testament is a prophecy that God is going to one day send Elijah uh, before the great and awesome day of the Lord, it says, Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And so they were waiting on Elijah to actually come. Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. And so that was the second possibility. The third possibility was simply that he's just one of the prophets. Moses performed miracles. He sent the plagues on Egypt. He brought water from the rock, different things like that, miracles. Over and over and over again, Elijah, Elisha raised people from the dead, stopped the sky from pouring down rain. Elijah prayed and fire came down and consumed the place. So, so miracles over and over and over again, they're just saying he's just one of the prophets. And so there are three options here to consider for them. But when Herod, verse 16, heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. This was his conclusion, number one. For it was Herod who had been sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death. But she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. And this is what's interesting, the fact that verse 20 says, For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. What's interesting here is that Herod locked him up in prison because he didn't like what he had to say, and yet it greatly upset his wife. And yet, he was hearing what John was saying. kind of reminds me, there's a prophet in 1 Kings chapter 22, his name is Micaiah, and he doesn't get a lot of screen time, but he's one of my favorite prophets, actually, because he just kind of, it's kind of feisty, if you think about it. Anyway, so the king of Judah and the king of Israel get, get together, and they're talking. Should we go out to war? Should we go take this land? Should we go do this? And the king of Israel, the north, uh, is like, well, is there a prophet that we can talk to? You know, just to, just to make sure that God is in favor of what we're doing, that he's going to go before us, that we're going to have victory, like, is there someone that we could talk to? They're just going to kind of give us the, the good luck charm. You know, just tell us, like, it's okay to go for it. God will bless you. And the king of Judah is like, well, there is, but 
I don't, I hate him. That's what he said. I hate him because he never prophesies anything good. He only ever prophesies evil toward me. And it's like, well, yeah, because you're evil. Like, if you would just walk with the Lord, he would prophesy all sorts of good things toward you, but you won't walk with the Lord. And so there's only evil and disaster that's going to come upon you. So they bring him in, and they ask him, and Micaiah's like, oh, yeah, you're going to be fine. Go for it. And he's just being sarcastic, though. You know, obviously, you're not going to be. You know, don't go for it. And so the king of Israel is like, how long? Just tell me the truth. Just tell me... Tell me what God has to say. And Micaiah is like, don't go. <laughs> He's saying it's very clear. That would be a foolish decision. And he says it in a little bit different words. But the guy, the king is like, did I not tell you? He always prophesied evil against me. And so it's kind of like he didn't like what he had to say, yet he still brought it to hear what he had to say. And so we have to have the same thing here. Herod did not like what he had to say, and yet he would listen to him. And a very similar thing happened to Paul in Acts chapter 24, verses 24 through 27. It says, after some days, Felix came with his wife. Paul's in prison at this point. He's, he's been imprisoned. Uh, he's been locked up. And he's, he sent for Paul, and he heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. Paul was speaking about righteousness and the coming judgment. And Felix was alarmed, it says. He was alarmed. And he said, go away. <laughs> I'm not ready for this. Go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. And it actually said that he sent for him often and conversed with him. But when two years had elapsed, Felix was no longer the governor there. Someone else had come into that seat. And because it pleased the Jews, he left Paul in prison. And so we have the same thing for both of these men, that Paul and John were left in prison speaking to two ungodly men who were willing to hear him, converse with him, but they were unwilling to receive the truth. And I wonder how many people are in churches today, uh, all over the country, that are in the same boat, week in and week out, hearing the truth of God's word, and yet not allowing it to transform and change their life. Not not, re not really receiving it. Just kind of like the four soils that Jesus talked about in Mark chapter 4 gave that parable about the four soils. Some of the seed falls on the rocky path, and it doesn't even have time to take root. The birds of the air come, which is Satan. He comes, and he just takes it from them. And so these guys, they would listen to him, but as soon as they sent them away or back to jail, they would just forget about it until the next time. And they would never allow God's word to actually have any effect in their lives. And that's what's going on here with Herod. Herod is intrigued with what he's saying, uh, but his, his being intrigued uh, does not lead to transformation of his life, does not lead to salvation, which, which is what it's supposed to lead to. And so you can imagine how John felt in this in this sense. Not only am I locked away, but people, the people that God has sent me to, they will not listen. They will not listen. Matthew 11, 2 through 3, this is, this is a message from John. When John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, this is what he's saying to Jesus. Are, are you the one who is to come? Or shall we look for another? This is John the Baptist we're talking about. Like Jesus even said, among those born of women, like no one's greater than John at this point. Like, he, he had such an awesome ministry. You were literally the forerunner, like rolling out the red carpet for the Messiah of the world. That's your ministry. And John at this point is, is kind of questioning. You know why he's questioning? Because... It doesn't actually make a lot of sense. This isn't working out the way that I thought it would work out. Because in his mind, and in the minds of the disciples, and in the minds of Israel, they're thinking, when the Messiah comes, he'll set up his kingdom. And Israel will be saved. And yet, at this point, Jesus is making more enemies than friends. John's in prison. This guy's not listening to him. And, and nothing's really working out the way that John had thought. And so he sends this message, are, are you the one who is to come, or, or shall we look for another? And so you can imagine the roller coaster of emotions here as John would at times ask God, what are you doing? God, why do the wicked prosper? That's a question that have, there's an entire book in the Old Testament devoted basically to that question. Have a good why do the wicked prosper? Why do they keep getting away with this? Why are you doing this, Lord? Uh, what is going on? I have followed you, and where has it gotten me? It's a question. 
I have followed you, Lord. Where has it got me? Where have I ended up? I'm in prison for you. Because I was faithful to your word. Where will following God get you? The first answer to that question is that in this world, you will be persecuted. You will be persecuted. It is a guarantee. You mark it on the calendar. The second answer to that question is that in this world, you may be executed. You may lose your life. And you may think, oh, that will never happen here. But let me tell you that in this picture, there are people, not everyone, not, I'm not saying that, not everyone, maybe not even not even the majority, just, just there are people in this picture, though, that would prosecute you and put you to death in a heartbeat if they had the opportunity. Because they hate Christianity and everything that it stands for. They absolutely hate it. But just like Herodias in this passage, they're held back from doing the harm they'd like to do. But what happens when that opportunity arises? What then? When they classify everything a Christian says as hate speech or nullify the First Amendment? Will you and I follow God to the very end? Because, believe me, I, I mean, I pray that as long as God's church is here, this never happens in our country. But one day, very soon, God is going to remove his church from this world, and all of those people who are still here will receive exactly what they want, a Christless world with no church and no gospel presence to stand in their way. And anybody who does not get saved during that time, any, anybody who does get saved during that time and refuses to conform and celebrate their demonic paganism will quickly be put to death. This is what it says in Revelation 6, through uh, 9 through 11. When he opened the fifth seal, this is the day still to come, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness that they had borne. For the witness that they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice. This is, this is their cry. O oh, sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? How long, O oh Lord? You can hear their cry as they're asking the basic question, why was any of this allowed to happen? What is going on? What are you doing, Lord? We, I love that you're patient, but you're a little too patient. Like, where's the justice? You know, I want it now, type of thing. Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves. And so there's actually a number that God already has in his mind of men and women who will be killed for the faith during the great tribulation that is to come. And God says to these individuals who have been slain, just like John, they've had their heads cut off. They've, they've lost their lives for the faith. And, and, and God comes in, he clothes them. He says, just a little while longer. I hear you. I, lo I love you. I hear your cries. And I know that it, it, there's, there's still a lot of pain to be felt. But judgment is coming. Judgment is coming, I promise you. And so you just, just wait just a little while longer. The global erroneous opportunity is coming. And whether or not we ourselves experience execution for our faith, there are many people who have, many people who are, many more people who will in the days to come. John was one of those. It says in verse 21, but an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. First of all, that's a terrible thing to do. Like, why would you ever, why would you ever say, I mean, I would have asked for half the kingdom if it was me. But anyway, she wanted a head. And he vowed to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, for what should I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. And she came in and immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body, and they laid it in the tomb. Following God, where does it get you? In this passage, it gets you dead. And that's kind of the weight of the passage. 
are you and I willing to follow the Lord even in this? I think of this couple right here, and many of you will know where I'm going with this. Davy and Natalie Lloyd never met them. Probably no one in this room has ever met them. Missionaries in Haiti. But they're now in heaven. I apologize, I'm going to need another issue real fast. The reason is because on Thursday evening they were killed for their faith. In Haiti. A gang came and, and took their lives. And so now they're in heaven. That their bodies are, are being transported currently back to the United States. But here are two people that there's the there's the verse in Hebrews. It's the first one that comes to my mind, and it's the faith chapter. It's in Hebrews chapter 11, and it's talking about men and women. And initially, it's starting to talk about men and women who, though they were they were looking ahead to things to come, to a, to a bright future, that they never received those things. Like, they were waiting for the Messiah. For him to set up his kingdom. Obviously that has not happened yet. But it starts out by talking about people who they received good things. A blessed life. We talk about Noah. Noah received God's favor. Built a boat. Survived the flood. Made it through. He was faithful. And God protected him. And preserved him. Then we talk about Abraham. And Abraham, it took time. But then God gave him a son. God provided for him. Protected him. Preserved him. All the while, made him a promise, I'm going to bless you, I'm going to multiply you, I'm going to give you a son. And talk about um, Moses. Moses, I'm going to use you in a mighty way to deliver my people from Egypt. We talk about people who, who did receive good things. They were still looking forward, but they received good things. But then it talks about Brad and others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy. Haiti was not worthy for two of God's messengers, literally in their midst. God himself working in and through the lives of his people. The world is not worthy of it. The world is not worthy of you. If you're a Christian here, the world is not worthy of you. And yet God has provided you. We ask the question, why would God leave us here? And not just take that we would much rather go to heaven. And yet God left us here because he cares so deeply for this world. The world is not worthy of us here. The world was not worthy of these two. And they have lost their lives for this gospel. And it causes us to ask the question, where will following God get you? What on earth is happening? In this world, you will be persecuted. It's guaranteed. In this world, you may be executed. Jesus said in chapter, Matthew chapter 10, verse 16 through 22, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, for they will deliver. This is not a good way to like mobilize people or get like a, a rallying group. Yeah, like we're going to go die. You know, like, that won't raise an army usually. But, but look at this. This is what he told his disciples. They will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and to the Gentiles. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious. Brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father and his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. The one who endures to the end will be saved. Matthew 19 Different context, different conversation, but later on in the account, Peter said, Lord, we have we've left everything for you. What then will we have? And I actually think that's a very honest question. Because of what we're talking about in Mark chapter 6, 14 through 29, it just ends with John, he's dead, his body's in the tomb. Where's the hope in that? That's how he leaves it. And then we just move on to the next thing. It's like all hope is lost. If that's how the story, like what's in it for us kind of thing, if this is what's to be expected, that we will be persecuted and we might be executed. And Jesus says, truly, I, this, is, this is what's in it for you. Truly, I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel and everyone who has left house or brothers or sisters, or father, or mother, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, will receive a hundredfold, and will inherit eternal life. The rewards are more than you and I can count. 
where will fallen God get you? In this world, you will be persecuted. In this world, you may be executed. But after this, you will be exalted. Second Timothy 4, 6-8, this is the end of Paul's life. He is about to be put to death himself. He is about to be executed, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness. You can trade that crown of thorns for this crown of righteousness. This crown of thorns is for this life only. But there is coming a day when God will give us a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. There is a reward in store for you if you love his appearing. Blessed is the man, James 1.12, who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. 1 Peter 5.4, when the chief shepherd appears when the chief shepherd appears you will receive the unfading crown of glory revelation 2 7 the one who conquers i will grant to eat of the tree of life which is in the paradise of god revelation 2 10 through 11 be faithful unto death and i will give you the crown of life the one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death revelation 2 17 to the one who conquers i will give some of the hidden manna and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on that stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. So out of billions of people in heaven and, and, and trillions of angelic beings, whenever God calls your name, you're the only head that turns. Because no, there's not 85 maps at the same high school class. Like, no, there's only one name. You're the only one who has that name that God gives you. Revelation 2, 26-28, The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron, even as I myself have, have received authority from my Father. And I will give him the morning star. Revelation 3, 5, the one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments. And I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. That is honor right there. Revelation 3, 9 through 12, behold, I will make those. If you ever want people to apologize to you, <laughs> I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and not but lie, behold, I will make them come and bow down at your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you because you have kept my word about patient endurance. I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, and my own new name, your mind forever. Revelation 3.21, the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Like, can you imagine that? The rewards that God has in store for those who are faithful, who endure for just a short time, are more than we can, more than we can imagine. And it's why Paul, who even lost his life for the gospel, Basically, it's like, therefore, Romans 8, 18, I'm, I'm looking at all the suffering, but I'm looking ahead at what's coming. It says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing the glory that is to be revealed to us. The sufferings of this present time, the persecutions, the executions, whatever it might be, there's obviously suffering, like uh, sickness and different things that we undergo in this life. This passage is specifically talking about persecutions and executions, obviously, for our for our passage, but he says that all the sufferings, doesn't matter what sufferings it might be, they're not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us. We suffer for just a short time here. 70, 80, maybe 90, maybe 100 years if we're very, very lucky. But then it's over. And then it's just eternal blessing, eternal honor, eternal glory forever. It will never end. Following God, where does it get you in this world? You will be persecuted. That's a guarantee. You walk with the Lord. In this world, you may be executed. Uh, it's a possibility. But after this, this is what we never forget. After this, you shall be exalted. And what this means is that your persecution, your death, it's not the end of the story. Not John here. Mark just kind of ended it so that we would contemplate, we would consider what on earth is God doing, what is happening in this account, 
Is that it? Is all hope lost? And yet for the one, it's not, it's not the end of the story because there is one who is greater than even John, who was martyred, whose body was laid in a tomb, but who truly was raised from the dead three days later. And he holds the, death, the keys to death and Hades, and he will unlock the door of, uh, for life to literally anyone who simply believes in him and trusts him and asks. You may think, well, why would I want to undergo so many trials and hardships in this life? But the real question is, why would you so easily give up and sacrifice your eternal life for such short-sightedness? This life, compared to all of eternity, is just a blip, and that's it. That's all, that's all we face, that's all we endure, that's all we suffer, just a blip. And then it's over. It's hard going through it. It's always hard. When we look, we read biographies, and we're like, man, that guy, that girl has a great destiny or a great life. Like, wow. But can you, but we never, it's hard to think about, like, what it took to get to that point. And all the suffering and all the pain and all the trials and all the tragedy and all the endurance that it took. And yet then we see what happened afterward. That's, that's what we want. Women endure nine months of pregnancy because... They know the end result is worth the pain. Absolutely. Olympic athletes, they sacrifice everything for year after year after year ever since they're a child. They don't eat donuts like we do. <laughs> also, they can get a medal and national honor because they consider that reward to be so much greater, so much more valuable. Yes, this life is hard. It's hard for everybody. But only God's people will receive God's eternal blessings and honor and glory. It's over us. As, as God's people, you're a Christian already. Hey, there are things that happen that we just don't have the answers to. It's kind of like Mark leaving it, leaving it to provoke some thought. We just don't always have the answers to certain things that happen. Why people treated us a certain way, or, or maybe even why, like in the book of Acts, James, the apostle, was killed with the sword. And Herod was about to kill Peter because he saw that it pleased the Jews. It got him brand points, but God saved Peter from jail, led him out of there. Well, why didn't God save him? We don't really know those answers, but it goes back to God's character. God is a good God. He's a gracious God. He's a loving God. He has an eternal plan. He has a mindset, and we can't even, a perspective of things that we can't even imagine. And no matter what he chooses to do or what he chooses to allow, is for a reason. And so for us as, as believers, to trust that, yes, there is suffering. God actually, Jesus led his disciples into suffering. I'm sending you out as, as feet in the midst of wolves. And yet, he did it knowing that, listen, the end result is only loss. It's only honor. It's only glory. And so keep that in mind. Keep that in focus. Because no matter what happens in this world, in this society, in whatever, know that the end for us who are in Christ is eternal exaltation. But if you're not a Christian, you've never trusted in a Christ, say, let's say that you be that day. Because non believers will never receive exaltation. They may not be persecuted in the same way, though persecution is kind of common for everybody. Again, we're all going to suffer in life. You may not lose your life, but suffering is just part of this world. And so why wouldn't we just give our lives wholly to God to receive that exaltation only he can bring? And so let's let's just cry out to him for a second in prayer. Heavenly Father, God, I want to pray for my church family. God, I want to pray for each and every one of them, each man and woman, child. God, I pray this is a special blessing upon each and every one of their lives. Where this is a hard passage, it's not an easy one. Thankfully, next week it's a little bit lighter. But Father, we know that this is your word, and that this is the possible reality for each and every one of us who claim the name of Christ. And God, I pray that each and every one of us this week, today, even. God, we would consider these things before you in communion with you. God, and that we would confirm in our hearts, in our spirits, in our minds, I, we will follow you no matter where you lead. 
no matter what you lead us into, God, we will trust in you. We will love you. We are devoted to you. And Father, we know that uh, the suffering in this present life, the persecutions, the hardships, and even the death, God, it's nothing compared to the glory and the reward that you have for your people. Father, if there's anyone in here who's not yet a Christian, I pray that they would receive that reward, that, that eternal reward that you're offering them. I pray that they would just cry out to you, Lord. There's not any magic words, secret prayer, or anything I can give. It's just then crying out to you, asking you to save them and to rescue them from their sins, to trust in you, God, admitting that they're a sinner, believing that you're the Savior. You died on the cross for their sins and rose again, and just confessing you as their Lord. Father, we love you. We trust you. We know that you're good. You have an eternal plan. And Father, we just commit our hearts, our lives, our minds, our bodies and souls to you. God, we don't fear man for what man can do. We fear you. You are the God of heaven and earth. And we know that each and every one of us, we stand or fall for our own master. So Father, we commit our lives into your hands. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen.